Welcome everyone to CG webinar seminar number 299. I think um, the uh, Australian innings uh, against South Africa in 1931 was closed by Captain Bill Woodfall when Don Bradman was on 299. So let's hope that we don't have that experience here and we do reach the 300 uh, which seminar which we uh, have planned with all bells and whistles on on Thursday. But today it's Hong Kong and I see Hong Kong faces and names coming into the uh, coming into the webinar, which is great. Uh, our topic is British national overseas citizenship holders and UK higher education. And we're particularly indebted to Michael Natsler for setting this up and you'll meet Michael in a moment. I'll take you through the webinar protocols, then I'll briefly introduce the speakers and then I'll be handing over to Michael. Now, remember during the webinar, we record this uh, and it goes onto our YouTube channel site and via our website or directly into YouTube, uh, usually within 24 hours or so, Trevor's pretty quick to get the webinars up. We also post the chat, the public section of the chat from today's webinar on our website. Now, during the webinar, Please keep yourself muted because extraneous noise coming in from people's mics can disrupt the webinar. Uh, and you don't need your camera on either um, during the uh, presentation part of the webinar. We recommend that you use speaker view in the top right hand corner there with the red arrow so you can clearly see who is talking at any given time. Uh, now, to ask a question, to join the Q&A part of our webinar, which is an important part of the webinar, uh, use the chat function, post your question or your statement about the presentation into the chat and I will select uh, participants in the discussion part of the webinar on the basis of what's coming forward there. So come forward early and you're much more likely to get selected into the, uh, the, the Q&A part. Um, when we um, do invite you in and I'll send you an email uh, uh, or a message, sorry, in the chat to the, to the effect uh, that we want you to, to, to ask your question on camera. Um, you uh, turn on your mic and your camera, and then when you come in, you uh, say who you are and where you're from. Now, today's, today's guests, today's presenters, Michael Natsler, who led the Higher Education Policy Institute's work on China, HEPI's work on China, and some will know him from that, and he's now working as a consultant at the NAUS Group. One of my students is working with him, I believe. Uh, that's an international management consultancy with a specialism in higher education, doing a lot of quite important work in UK and elsewhere. Um, Michael is joined by uh, Kaho Mok, who is the vice president and concurrently chair professor of comparative policy at Lingnan University in Hong Kong, a very active uh, social researcher, policy researcher on higher education matters and internationalization in particular, and someone that is active in all our CG researcher circles. And you will have seen, those of you who know CG's work will have seen Kaho's uh, face and name many times. Um, our third speaker, Thomas Chan, is um, the casework officer lead for Hong Kongers in Britain, a civil society organization established in July, 2020. It's the uh, first Hong Kongers expat diaspora and community building group uh, set up in the UK since the UK announced the introduction of a welcome program for Hong Kongers. And you'll hear more about that work in a moment. Um, I won't uh, continue to read out the bio at this point. Corrine Squire, our fourth speaker, is a chair in global inequalities at the University of Bristol School for Policy Studies. And previously, it was director of the Centre for Narrative Research at East, Lo East London and has honorary positions at the UCL Social Research Institute, the Manchester Institute of Education. Um, Sunda Kadwala, our final speaker on the list, is the director of British Future. He has previously worked as a journalist and he was general secretary of the Fabian Society think tank from 20, 2003 to 2011, previously a lead writer and internet uh, editor at The Observer, search director of the Foreign Policy Center and commissioning editor for politics and economics at Macmillan, the publisher. That's not a bad CV. 
um, uh, very impressive and cross-sectoral in, in nature. And uh, we look forward to the contributions of all of our speakers. At this point, I'm happy to hand over to Michael. Thank you, Simon, um, and thank you, CJHE, for making room for the um, webinar and a really busy program. Um, CJHE is one of the things which really inspired me. So I'm, I'm really, really touched to be speaking on a, on a webinar today with you. Um, I was keen to put this together because BNO holders have been largely invisible um, in public higher, higher education policy discussions, but I think they need more attention. Um, in this spirit, I'm, I'm organising this webinar in the hope that it'll get more people thinking about what the BNO route means and what it could mean for, for UK higher education. Um, the presentations today are, are meant to be early reflections, not the final word on this theme, and it'd be great to hear as much as possible from the audience as well, um, as CGHE webinars always bring in um, an expert audience. So before handing over to um, the fantastic panel, I'm just going to set the scene around um, BNO policy in the UK more broadly, um, and then outline some of the key points um, as I see them uh, of how BNO holders and the BNO route might impact UK higher education. Some of this might be familiar or not, so I've tried to strike a, a balance between between the two. Um, so British national overseas status was offered to people um, who before the 1997 Hong Kong handover um, had British dependent territories citizenship through a connection with Hong Kong. Um, they were able to apply for BNO status in the 10 years before the handover in 1997. Fast forward 23 years, um, and in July 2020, the UK Home Secretary outlined the details for the bespoke immigration route, which would allow British national overseas citizens and their immediate family members to move to the UK to work and to study. Um, under current rules, after five years, BNO holders are, are able to apply for permanent settlement, and then 12 months later, they can if they want to apply for British citizenship. Uh, the scheme was launched in January 2021, about six months after the announcement. The announcement talked about the strong historic relationship with the people of Hong Kong, and the UK government said by opening this route, they were keeping their promise to them to uphold their freedom. Um, it came in the context of the national security legislation imposed on Hong Kong, um, which I'm sure people will be familiar with in the call. Um, when the UK government opened this route in January 2021, so just about 18 months ago, they estimated between 250 and 350,000 people would, would take up the offer in the first five years. That is by 2026. And in the first year, there have been, um, sorry, at the end of 2021, there had been 104,000 applications. So the estimate doesn't seem to be too far out. Um, that said, there are many moving parts with push and pull factors. Um, and as we will see, the fee status of higher education could be one of them. Um, you know, these estimates could be high or low, but, but this is, we're still waiting to see. Um, some surveys about BNO holders have shown that they are, they are here to stay and integrate. One figure which stood out for me was that 96% said they have no plans to return to Hong Kong. Um, they face different challenges around integration, mental health, jobs, and other things. Um, and, and, you know, the experiences will, will vary widely. Just before I move on to a few thoughts about what the BNO route means for higher education, I thought I'd just recap a couple of a couple of changes which I think are useful to highlight before we go into the panel discussion. Um, so originally BNO holders had no recourse to public funds, which means they had no entitlement to most welfare benefits from income support to housing benefit. But um, due to policy changes by mid 2021, they are eligible to join the waiting list for social housing. Um, I think this is important because it reflects that BNO holders who are coming to the UK are not all, um, as some media outlets would have us believe, affluent financial services workers but they come from a range of financial backgrounds. And this is important to recognize when we're thinking about access to UK higher education. I'm also flagging this because it highlights that policy around BNO holders is being shaped and changed and BNO holders aren't forgotten by policymakers and that um, work by people like Sunder to try and have a shift in the policy around higher education access is possible because there is a lively conversation going on, on around BNO holders in higher education. And the second point um, I want to highlight is uh, the announcement in February this year, which um, I think if the plans go ahead, will open up um, the BNO route to, to um, people who are uh, the children of BNO holders, but who themselves are not BNOs, um, so they'd be able to apply independently. And this is also important because this opens up um, the opportunity for many sort of people under the age of 24, effectively, um, to come to the UK on the BNO route. And should that be in the context of a fee change, then that will, that will be an interesting um, point which I'm going to touch on. So closing there on general opening um, context about the BNO route, I'm going to turn to a few of my thoughts on 
um, why I think it's important that UK higher education thinks about um, the BNO route. Um, and this is partly because um, the, the topic of BNO holders in higher education is largely unexplored by those within the sector. And it's been taken up by groups focused on Hong Kong and BNO holders um, like Tommy Chan, Hong Kong is in Britain and Sunder Katwala from um, British Future. Um, and the focus there has, has tended to be in the context of higher education on accessing UK higher education. Um, under current rules, BNO, BNO holders are treated as international students with international fee status, which means they have, and they have no access to student loans um, and they also have a limited ability to access some courses with caps on international student enrolments. Um, of course, after five years in the UK, BNOs will have access to loans and home fee status, but under current rules, not before. Um, there's a tension here, which I think Sunder will unpack more fully, around um, young people coming to the UK and not having the same opportunities to access UK higher education as their peers, even if they're in UK schools. Um, in March, um, I estimated, looking at this issue, that more than 10,000 BNO holders might turn 18 without, without um, loan and home fee status over the next 10 years. Um, now, this is, a, this is a back of the envelope estimate using Hong Kong census data and the government, um, the government projections, but it shows that it's a, a significant enough issue that the higher education sector should have a think about this and spend some time thinking about it. Um, just keeping an eye on the clock, um, I'm going to leave um, to some other panelists the point around why you know, there's a compelling case that BNO holders should have home free status and loan access um, and, and move on to what other considerations universities might be thinking about when they assess um, whether they should support, oppose or find a way of working with the, um, the suggestions that BNO holders should have home fee status. So for many universities, I think this argument will have a strong appeal, um, but a critical consideration and a potential barrier which the sector um, and uh, BNO groups in the UK and British Future need to work around is the impact it might have on university finances by affecting the amount of Hong Kong international student fees universities get from Hong Kong students. So as we know, international student fees are an important part of university finance um, and the international education strategy and its two updates list Hong Kong as an important market. Um, a proposed fee change from international to home fees could have some knock-on effect on the revenue from Hong Kong students. What is not clear is how great an impact it might have. Um, at the moment, there is no distinction or mention of BNO holders in the international education strategy. So we can assume that BNO holders are currently being treated as part of the Hong Kong population and so included in the projections of future international student numbers from Hong Kong. Um, and at this point, I just want to share very briefly um, a slide which I think captures um, uh, a point which is best made in an image. So at the moment, um, the international education strategy um, will be looking at Hong Kong students and BNO holders in the same light as there's no difference in international fees. Um, also on, on financial and fee revenue grounds that there's no need to distinguish, although of course there are, on other grounds there are. Um, but now that the question of a fee status change has been posed, um, and the, these arguments are being, are being profiled and discussed. Um, in order for universities to think about what's possible and, and where they stand on this, they need, to be, uh, they, need to, they need to look at it a different way. So apologies, this is a slightly crude diagram, but I'm trying to illustrate that um, there will be an overlap between uh, BNO students and Hong Kong students, um, and um, that this will have an impact on, on, international, student, on international student revenue. Um, I'm not arguing that universities should be beholden to this, but I think it's an important thing which they'll have to understand um, and take into account when they're considering their stance on the fee change, because um, there's a potential that um, the Hong Kong international student market, the numbers would be impacted by um, changing uh, the BNO status from international student fees to home fees. Um, I have a few more comments, which maybe I can return to in the questions. Um, but I just close by saying that I think universities need to understand BNO holders and the scenarios that are emerging um, as possible futures to best engage with this. And I think it's possible for universities to square the, uh, the compelling appeal which people like Sundar make and I personally agree with, while also taking into account the practical considerations around fees. Um, ultimately, BNO holders are people who want to set up a life in the UK 
and higher education is an opportunity that could help many of them settle and adapt and we just need to work out how how best to do it um so on that note i'm going to pass over to sunder who's going to take us on for the next five or six minutes thank yeah. you um michael and it's uh, great to be involved in the event and thanks michael for what you've done to put this on the radar as you say it was not um an issue that people had noticed yet and it's important to do it british futures a charity and a think tank which has been running for 10 years we're interested in this being a confident inclusive and welcoming country in the last um six months we have also been housing the welcoming committee for hong kongers which is a network that brings together those in britain who are the welcomers interested in making integration work for Hong Kongers with the Hong Kongers who are coming to contribute to our society and we'll hear from other Hong Konger led groups who obviously are leading that work as well and so for that reason we've been looking at this issue of um, integration and higher education. Um, to put it in context the BNO visa is important in British society and British immigration history in my view this was one of the first big choices that Britain made after the EU referendum and Brexit about immigration policy and it was a choice to actually say we've got a historic responsibility and it's in our interests to welcome this group of people to Britain and it was very uncontroversial with the public across politics it was broadly uncontested as an issue you go back to 1990 and visas for people from Hong Kong was a massive fight in British politics, between Paddy Ashdown and Norman Tebbit and other people, there was a consensus, all sorts of reasons, the right, the left and centre of British politics think this was the right thing to do, we've got to make it work. And we've got a welcoming programme for Hong Kongers, and it's probably the best organised integration scheme we've seen for a migrant group as it arrives. And Britain's been quite good at integration, but just getting there a bit late. And it's never been proactive and on the front foot. And this year we've been on the front foot with Hong Kong. So I think we should be proud of the scheme and of the commitment to making it work. The case about fee status is a very simple case. It's a case about values. It's a case about fairness. The message of the welcoming scheme is welcome to your new home. You know, you're going to contribute here. and We welcome that contribution. If we're welcoming you to your home, you're a home student. It really should be as simple as that. If you were... 19 out of 20 people don't see themselves going again. If you come to secondary school, third year, fourth year, fifth year, you're in the peer group of people. It might be that in terms of the fairness case, if you were only coming to Britain to go to LSE or UCL, you know, that in fairness, you are as somebody who's engaged with Britain is as an international student. And, you know, it might be useful or too complicated to work out that distinction. But broadly speaking, if you come to school in Britain, you should be a home student. People will acquire that by 2026 or five years after they arrived. So if I'm a 17 year old or an 18 year old doing my A levels and I've got an 11 year old sibling, I will be an international student when my peer group go to university my 11 year old sibling will be a home student in 2026 and if it's the right policy in 2026 or 27 for my 11 year old sibling i think it's the right policy for the person sitting their a levels this summer education really matters to the hong kongers that come to britain um it's been important in people's choices of location finding out about schools and where the schools are i think a lot of people have come because they want their children to grow up in a society with freedom and democracy and having to make a big adjustment in their lives for that and this group is going to contribute enormously to britain seven out of ten of the cohort coming have graduate education they're the aspirations but there, there will be barriers if we don't if we don't make this change and there's another fairness case to make the change we've made this change for ukrainian students very quickly because it was the right thing to do we treat as an exception refugees to britain the hong kong visa is not a refugee visa but people have come for the lifeboat of refugee status from political persecution. This, this scheme was a response to political events in the UK. It was organised quickly, which is why it didn't iron out all of the details about no recourse to public funds. Most people haven't heard about this, and it's a common sense case. Um, two possible futures, I think. Um, we, we had a letter at the end of May. We had politicians from both parties. I think many of the people we asked to sign it hadn't noticed the issue yet. We had a broad civic society, Hong Kong led groups, academics in British universities, British civic society. People see the fairness case. I think, you know, 6,000 people a year have been applying from Hong Kong to Britain and, you know, got to look at the practicalities. Um, two ways forward now, uh, um, Michael. One is, the important thing is to fix it by August 
Um, fix it tomorrow would be good, but fixing it by August is important because people in Sutton, in Trafford, in Middle Keynes, in Birmingham, towns and cities everywhere, they'll be getting their A-level results in August and new Hong Kongers will be getting their A-level results. And that is a day of joy and hope and potential. And I want the Hong Kong BNO visa holders to feel the joy and the hope of the potential for it to be a happy day, not a sad day, when you worry about whether you've got the access to the things your peer group has got. And I say to government ministers and MPs as well, fix it by August, because there's a positive story about the contribution we're unlocking. Why would we turn that into, into, into a, a sad story, really, about people who still need something to change? to achieve their potential. If it's not fixed, if we can't make this common sense case quickly, we'll have to get into what can universities do to create access, who is completely excluded. It's not just the fee level, it's the access to the loans and the funds. So there's a harder issue to get right if we can't win the argument for fairness and values, but let's try to win that argument. Let's try to win it this summer for the dozens or hundreds of young people who'll be waiting to hear what happens. Thank you. And I think now it goes on to um, Corinne, Corinne Square. Thanks. Thanks, Linda. Thank Over to you. Thank you. Um, thanks very much, Linda. It's a real honour to be speaking with you today. Um, it's a strange day to be speaking with you, uh, since the UK is about to fly uh, asylum seekers to Rwanda, many of whom will have been in university, will be hoping to continue their university in the UK, will have been planning to go to university in the UK. Um, I think what that points to, I'm going to put that aside, but what that does point to is the real policy precarity of people who have refugee or refugee-like status in the UK. Um, putting it aside, though, I think it's clear that there's, as Sundar said, and Michael too, there's a pretty overwhelming case for BNO holders to have uh, home status, um, as, as in fact other people recently set, resettled have had people from Afghanistan as well as uh, from Ukraine. And of course, everybody receiving refugee status in the UK or who has received it also now has home, home status as a, as, a, as a university student. So I'm going to just kind of talk as if, I mean, I, I realise this is an assumption, but as if that's going to happen. Um, my involvement in this area is through working with um, the Open Learning Initiative, which is a programme called um, OLIVE, uh, which provides support for people from refugee backgrounds or refugee-like backgrounds hoping to go into higher education in the UK. And um, that's a, actually a Cross Europe programme, um, but we've been working in the UK since about 2017. And our recent experience is, as you might expect, and I'm sure this is true for Hong Kongers, that people being resettled rightly um, want to get on with their lives as soon as they can. Um, they don't want to put things on hold. Um, but that making the transition into um, uh, UK higher education, regardless of the fee situation, is, is can be problematic. You know, the structure is different. There are issues of, of, of uh, com comparability between um, qualifications, and then there are issues also of, of language requirements. Uh, and then there's a whole other group of people who are aiming to go into higher education who maybe haven't already. And I think this might be significant for people from Hong Kong, where I gather that HE sector is not as large proportionally, um, but that people may want to go later in life. And those people also need uh, support and access of slightly different types than the people who are like ready to go. Um, so um, resettlement services in general, uh, the welcome hubs for Hong Kongers and all kinds of resettlement services are stretched with this. And I think that's only going to increase. And then there are organizations like in a small way us and uh, people like Refugee Education UK and um, uh, student action for refugees who provide some help also they're also going to be stretched um, you can see also i think that um, the provision uh, that's happening in the 16 to 19 year old sector is going to be uh, um, uh, under pressure uh, the 19 plus sector also and access courses and then as michael's talked about um, there are already, um, and they've written about, I think, uh, there are already demographic pressures coming on UK universities and then economic pressures, not just around um, uh, international students, but more general economic pressures around the loan book and so on that UK universities are facing. Um, so uh, that's all kind of problematic, but notwithstanding that, I think universities can do quite a lot and we should be kind of encouraging to, them to do that. For instance, um, there's a lot that they're already doing in widening participation with, with international students and with um, outreach and access work, um, which they do with already people from refugee and refugee-like backgrounds. Um, but 
In that case, unlike for other people from very low HE access backgrounds, and that's true for refugees all over the world, that they're from, they're, they're, their access to higher education dramatically drops when they become refugees. Um, uh, in, in the UK HE sector, there is no specific provision for people from refugee or refugee back backgrounds, but we found, and I think many others too, um, that uh, for people from those backgrounds, the lack of UK social networks, the lack of other kinds of capital in the UK, um, and the different experiences, the really overwhelming experiences that people have been through in their countries, in transit, and then in the UK itself, do mean that it's quite helpful to have some quite dedicated provision for people to get into higher education and then when they're there to support them um, within higher education. And then if you look more broadly at studies both from our context and from the German context where of course uh, there's been a lot of uh, emphasis on providing university provision and access for a very large number of uh, people from refugee backgrounds. Um, well that, support, that supports for instance um, the provision of a really quite distinctive uh, kind of uh, preparation that is strengths-based for refugees, that is not all about their deficits, that is not all about the things that, the hoops they have to jump through, the requirements that they have to meet, but that recognizes what they bring to the situation. And that also works long-term, uh, so that people are not necessarily expected to deliver straight away on uh, education, on, on university progress, but can do that over time. And that also recognizes, um, I think, as a couple of people have already mentioned, the long-term benefits of people from refugee backgrounds going into HE, which are not just about um, productivity and them having a high wage and contributing to a high wage knowledge economy, not all about that, but actually really strongly about their well-being and their inclusion. So I think um, we can encourage universities in these ways of working um, uh, to work more, and also um, the educational sector and the refugee sector more broadly to think about this kind of uh, work, preparing and bringing people from refugee backgrounds into higher education. Um, and uh, that's gonna need to scale up for people from Hong Kong, I think. Um, and it, it is very important, um, you know, repeatedly working with the Olive students, we hear this, you know, that, um, that education for them is one of the one of the prime motivations for them. And as they say, it's the thing that whatever else happens to you cannot be taken away from you. Thanks very much. Thank you, Karin. And I'm just going to go straight on to, on to Kaho. Over to you. OK, thank you, Michael, for the very kind invitation. My previous panelist has already uh, touched upon the issue regarding about the status of the Hong Kong gas uh, staying in the UK. Uh, but I would like to uh, draw uh, the discussion to the point of uh, being an international uh, community is so important. International connectivity and inclusiveness symbolize about uh, open city, a uh, global city of this kind. And I think uh, I can share about the experience in Hong Kong, uh, being an international city in Asia, Hong Kong, uh, government does invest a lot in uh, higher education by also welcoming students from all around the world, no matter uh, where they form, no matter how uh, uh, the, uh, the economic background they are, so long as they are very keen to come to Hong Kong uh, for study or stay in Hong Kong. After graduation uh, in Hong Kong University, they can stay over at least a year for finding job and then consecutively staying in Hong Kong for work for seven years with uh, the study time, they can apply for uh, permanent residence in Hong Kong. So uh, this is a very important point I want to draw because we are talking about, uh, we are facing about talent uh, war. Uh, this is a uh, talent pool. And I believe those uh, Hong Kong guys, the young people, uh, they are very strong, uh, have a very strong motivation to do good. Uh, in education. It's very much about the Confucian ethics and Confucian traditions in uh, Asia and in Hong Kong and China. People, uh, individual and family, they uh, care about uh, education, particularly higher education. So I, I just want, want to talk about, you know, the talent uh, pool uh, position. If we are talking about treating those uh, young people, no matter where they are from Hong Kong, from all around the world, they are making a significant contribution uh, to the future development of Britain. And more importantly, if we think about uh, the discussion from the bringing and bring drain dimension, I think uh, we have to add the dimension about bring beaches and bring circulation. I understand the British government after the Brexit uh, is very keen to develop different form uh, bilateral or multilateral relationship across the world, particularly the government in the UK is very keen to develop the relationship and partnership in ASEAN. 
So given the potential this uh, Hong Kong young people, uh, they were born in Hong Kong and grew up in Hong Kong having the Asian experience, they speak a uh, very good Mandarin and their native language supposedly is Cantonese. If we can groom this group of Hong Kong guys, uh, uh, groom them and nurture them become the leaders and give them hope in the UK, they would become uh, uh, brain bridges and brain circulation. They could uh, connect, uh, even though some of them, as the survey, uh, Michael just mentioned, they have no intention to go back to Hong Kong for residence, but it doesn't mean that they cannot go back to Asia or other part connecting British uh, society to the East. I think uh, this angle, uh, bring bridges would be important. And I want to conclude by saying that education is not only for economic sake, and that's as important. Having young people uh, graduating from university may have contributing to the future economy, but more importantly, higher education can also produce very good citizenship. And those people, they are well-educated, civilized, and they could be uh, having an international uh, uh, outlook and also well-connected to Asia. So thinking about the government uh, in the UK is very keen to establish relations with Far East, and this group of people would be uh, in my opinion, we found a very fun, uh, a, strong, a strong foundation as a talent pool uh, for the UK and also and beyond. So it's my short comment. Thank you very much. That was super. And then over to Tommy Chan, who's going to finish us off in the last the last um, five minutes of the panel, and then we'll go over back to Simon and open for questions. Um, over to you, Tommy. Thank you very much. Um, good afternoon or good evening, wherever you are. I am Kay's Work Officer Lead uh, from Hong Kong in Britain, and we are very privileged to have the funding from the Department for Leveling Up Housing and Communities and running Mission Perm uh, to support the Hong Kong's community moving to the UK. And um, with the aims of encouraging participation in local community life, Facility, uh, facilitating employment, building community relationships, and safeguarding mental health slash well-being. Um, casework team is um, uh, the work of casework team mainly falls under encouraging uh, participation in local community life, and we are providing casework supporting service um, to Hong Kongers moving to the UK um, online um, through online mode, and we um, take questions from the Hong Kongers community and try to relay. Uh, reliable uh, information from governmental sources, uh, from existing policies and guidance, so as to help them to understand better how is it, um, how does things work in the UK in a nutshell. So with regarding to the higher education's demand and inquiries, it, it is only a very small number in the proportion of cases that we received. But um, I think the main concern with um, higher education as previously um, stated and passionately um, advocated by the um, fellow panelists is that um, the need for education is extremely important um, in order for Hong Kong's community to continue to build their life in the UK and also unlock future potentials for the younger generation. Um, with the questions that we received with regarding to higher education inquiry, they could be from Scotland, could be in England, and also from Wales. Um, they have both like pointed to um, the needs of um, financial assistance. They might have made inquiries with regarding to home fee or student finance because they find it quite difficult um, in terms of um, financial um, burden that would be brought by assessing higher education with the lack of home fee excuse me and as we all know that like i'm um, worrying about the life and like in order to um stay here in the uk two five years to uh, apply for indefinite leave to remain uh, in order to get the, to the settled status in the uk before they can grant uh, they are granted the access to home fee or uh, or other financial um, subsidies or student finance this could um, create quite a huge well-being pressure to them that could also in terms of affecting the mental well-being. Um, there are some, well, we, I think like casework team, how we work is to give them a, a clear understanding as previously explained to, to help them to understand the existing policy in the UK, which to have a very um, honest conversation here is that like a lot of the time we feel that our hands are tied because of the existing policy. Um, even, and, and we also help to try, um, um, we help 
Oh, we try to help the um, our service users understand that like it is not only BNO visa holders that is experienced um, um, unable to um, access home fee. It is also for British citizen that like if they haven't been uh, normally resident uh, residing in the UK in the past three years, they are also unable to access home fee as part of the um, you know regulations in in terms of um, high education. But like nevertheless, like we are unable to provide very helpful assistance or advice on this matter. And then this is something that um, we are um, monitoring closely as our, um, cap well, within the capacity of our organization. And um, from a very realistic point of view, even with the access to um, student finance, it would be of great help um, for the Hong Kong's family and the community in general, because like even though universities might have scholarships that is available for international students, but that is still a limited amount and it won't be able to cover the full extent of the um, higher education, especially for like three years of undergrad programs, like it would be an enormous fee for the family to um, bear financially. And then also not to, um, we, we have to also remember that there will be another um, potentially a new batch of um, BNO visa holders when um, the UK government finally launch out the proposed um, policy change to allow uh, BNO holders, um, sorry, apologies, um, young adults with one or at least one BNO holder parent, they can apply a BNO visa and come to the UK individually. We are expecting to see a new batch of new um, BNO visa holders to come to the UK, and they are likely to be young adults in their age or in their early 20s. And then they might be also considering um, equipping themselves um, or changing careers in uh, into other uh, profession, which the key to achieve the success in this area would be assessing higher education. So this is something that is definitely going to um, have a huge impact on them if they are unable to assess home fee or assess student finance. Um, this would um, potentially bar them from advancing in their careers or it would obscure their future development in terms of um, setting up the new life in the UK. So, but at this moment, I think the casework team's work is still trying to help them to understand. And we are trying very hard to keep update to the latest policy and guidance and also advise the Hong Kong's community um, accordingly, whether they are already in the UK or in Hong Kong. So hopefully this could bring a bit of um, a frontline experience to everyone here so that to understand this matter and the severity of it uh, in a different angle. Thank you very much for having me today. Thank you. Michael, at this point, I think I step in um, and um, say thank you to all the speakers for enlightening us, um, bringing us so much information in a short uh, passage, but also I think there's an implicit and explicit call to action as well. Um, and, you know, it's difficult to get the government in the UK at the moment to focus on sensible long-term policies. Um, I, you know, you can make an argument uh, for opening the doorway properly to Hong Kong um, to Hong Kong um, citizens, residents who wish to go come to UK on an ongoing basis uh, on the basis of uh, the UK's historic obligations and responsibilities as a former coloniser. Uh, and, uh, you know, that argument can be made in relation to other parts of the world as well. I think that's one of the problems, of course, with that very proper um, and morally grounded historic argument that it, uh, the, 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 the British controlled so many parts of the world, so much of it, that uh, to open the doorway to uh, former colonies is to open it to a lot of people, um, not least in South Asia. But, um, you know, it's, it's, it is an historic obligation, particularly in, in relation to the manner in which, you know, the transition to China occurred. Um, the, but the problem, uh, expecting um, governments to make decisions on the, on the basis of moral obligations and better nature only, you know, takes you so far when you're lobbying and I think that the, the argument that really strikes me as the winning argument is the one that Carho has been alluding to about bridges and, uh, and nation building in the UK. I mean, what a resource for the UK, you know, former Hong Kong residents are. Um, I mean, this is a highly educated and capable community as on the whole, but not just that, 
it's the fact that it has an east-west sensibility. Um, and, um, you know, Hong Kong is not the home, the, the headquarters of many important international organisations and operations for nothing. It's because that environment is, is soaked in, in an understanding of the world, uh, a, a strong understanding of Western culture and a strong understanding of East Asia. Um, and, you know, a pivotal role between those two worlds. And, um, and that's long been Hong Kong's function um, for all kinds of historic and economic reasons. It's, it's played that role very well. Uh, and, you know, those sensibilities, that, that understanding of Asia, especially, which the UK doesn't have, and Europe as a whole doesn't have, you know, it's not just a UK problem, it's a, it's a Europe problem. And that bring, is a gift to a nation which has decided it wants to go its own way in the world and, you know, build a new global project and so on. So, I mean, what, what, you know, Hong Kong can give to the UK in terms of sensibilities and skills and knowledge and talents is enormous. Um, I've got a question actually arising from that, which is really the one about the nature of the diaspora, which you all know much better than me. Um, I mean, diasporic populations, when they move in large numbers to other to new countries, sometimes they retain their networks and identity and for generations. And other, other times they, they blend in and assimilate and eventually become indist or sometimes within a, two generations indistinguishable from other people in the new country. Um, what happens with people from Hong Kong when they go to UK in, in significant numbers? I mean, do they retain their identity as kind of East and West, Sinic and Chinese civilization and, and, and British at the same time? You know, do they dissolve into the British population, British culture? Um, you know, what, what's, what's likely to happen? Are they going to be able to continue on, on you know, things go, well, that bridge building role, which, which Caho talked about, or will they simply become British? Well, it's very difficult to come to any generalization because it's a personal choice. Yes, very much depends right. on the very much depends on the experience. But I think the inclusiveness and the international connectivity will be very important. Uh, if you think about uh, migrants, uh, population feeling the society, the local community is so welcoming, and com coming out with a productive uh, policy and also measures in including them in the local society would be very helpful. Number one. Uh, number two, I think it's very much depends on the UK government and its diplomatic relationship with, uh, with the Far East. And these were people, uh, for the sake of an argument, they've already born and grew up in Hong Kong and knowing very well about the culture, the language. I think it could be uh, if they become permanent residents and holding their UK passport, could be the ambassador of the UK reaching out to East Asia. But again, it's so difficult because it very much depends on the generation and generation, their choices. My, my, talking about my experience, I studied in the UK for my PhD, but I see I also worked in Bristol before. I see the merit having the, the mixed. Uh, I think I see myself uh, trying to do uh, something productive uh, to relate uh, myself to the West, but at the same time, I remain uh, Asian. But it doesn't mean that, you know, I have to uh, make only a choice that becoming British or <laughs> Hong Kong or, or, or Chinese. So I think it's a matter of choice, but I think this is really a, a, a rich experience that people can consider. So I just uh, I have a quick response, Simon. Yeah, well, you and I share a similar sensibility from opposite ends of the, you know, problem and both identifying and, and, and living in some sense historically or, or currently, you know, in, in both parts of the world. And I, I, I mean, I just think that's enormously valuable. And, um, but then we know it's invaluable for us. We know it's valuable for those we work with um, and know and members of our own families who are similar. But uh, I'm not sure that most of the rest of the world perceives things that way as yet. And people are looking for bordered identities. And of course, the primary question that many in the, in the UK would have in mind is, will these Will, will they fit in? You know, it's the sort of classic question that nations ask about mobile populations. Will they become like us? So there's work to be done to persuade people about the value of that, of that bridge building role, but gee, it's substantial. And, you know, people from Hong Kong and the next generation could play major leadership roles in the UK if things go well. 
and, uh, and you know, and, and I think globally important roles as, as a result. Um, I see Tommy's got a hand up. Um, we've got David Law about to come in, Tommy, but did, did you want to say something? Yeah, it's fine. I, I'll wait to um, David um, stated that first. I'm, okay, I'm David, just, uh, I course. think that's your go ahead. And uh, we'd be delighted to hear from you at this point. Hi, thank you, everyone. Um, yeah, I, this is a complicated issue. And of course, uh, I will advocate within my own university that we should be as flexible as possible. And I will advocate where I can that we should have a more open attitude towards Hong Kong migration. Uh, and of course, uh, I also think that there are lots of issues about defining fee status and categorization. Um, on the point that you made, Simon, about uh, Hong Kong migration to the UK, I, I, I simply think it's impossible, uh, as Kahod told us, you know, to make generalizations about how people fit in. They fit in in all sorts of different ways, whether they're Chinese, whether they're Chinese from Hong Kong, whether they're Indian, whatever, they fit in in all sorts of ways and they find their, their, their own way. The, the, the simple point that I wanted to make it in following up what Tommy had said is that it's not an easy issue for universities. It's not an easy issue because this is government regulated. Um, there are flexibilities that we, we can use and should try to use. Uh, but of course, the issue fundamentally is about access to student loans and about what the level of fee should be. And this is government regulated and it will come up against all sorts of problems like the problems that expat uh, UK families have if they've been away from the country, uh, unless they're in EU or Gibraltar or some other territories, they have to pay international fees. And, and therefore, I think this issue is not going to be a simple issue about Hong Kong migration. Did you want to comment, Tommy? Yes, I, I think that's an absolutely um, brilliant point that um, David just mentioned. I, I would also like try to draw um, some from the observation that I have had, like with regarding to the um, last generation of uh, migrants, also from Hong Kong, as you might already know. Um, so like that generation now in the 60s or plus, like they are quite embracing the um, Chinese identity uh, from general observation. But however, on the contrast, the they, sons and daughters, like the second generation of them, they are basically considering themselves as British because like they grew up in the UK, they speak English fluently, that's their native language. And they, but they, they also like um, encounter some degree of um, cu um, cultural, um, sorry, um, identity crisis, so to say, is that like they don't feel really fit in. But I, I think for this batch of um, Hong Kong as um, migration from Hong Kong, this scenario is a bit different because often um, how they perceive themselves, how they um, really value the, um, the identity of Hong Kongers as they, um, you know, um, try to separate themselves from the identity of um, being Chinese, but like, again, it is a very wide spectrum. So it is, as um, Kahu rightly said, that like, it's, it's very hard to draw a simple generalization of it. It is a matter of personal choice. And also people also come from um, Hong Kong, also came from Hong Kong for different uh, reasons. Um, some of them might be opportunist, um, like see, seeing the opportunity to come over. Oh, I, I have a BNO visa. Like I didn't know why I applied for it, but I have that. And now I'm eligible. So I decided to come. Um, and maybe hoping for to get a um, better future for their second generation. That could be it. They also might have fear driven so that like they want to escape from what they think already no longer suitable for them to live in the city or due to many, many different reasons. I think um, so. But as, as an organization, um, Hong Kongers in Britain are advocating and dedicating um, to, to um, promote um, integration between the Hong Kong community and the local um, mainstream community, so to say. Uh, as you can see from our um, activities and events that is um, hosted under Mission Perm, we, um, in different regions, we try to arrange uh, and like our, our colleagues are working very hard on this and um, to, to uh, increase the um, communication between the mainstream society and also the Hong Kong's community so that we can fully integrate into um, 
the UK society. Um, so I, I think that's also what the UK government is trying to achieve, like through um, giving out the funding scheme. So um, I don't know how I come to this conclusion, but hopefully this would give um, everyone a bit more context in terms of this matter. Thank you very much. Yeah, that's really good. And I also want to support David's point about access to the loan scheme, home country status in relation to tuition loans is really the crunch issue in this discussion. That's the one where we can all move forward with in higher education. That's the issue we can take up. I'd like to see Vivian Stern take that up at Universities UK. Uh, you know, it really is a crucial issue and she'll understand that issue. And I think she would be supportive and appreciative personally. Now, Paula is, Paula Lem is waiting to come in, but I noticed Sunday's put a hand up and that might mean you want to talk about the previous conversation that David instigated. Sunday, did you want to come in? Thanks. Um, yeah, um, just on this, I mean, my parents came to this country from India and Ireland, respectively, in the late 1960s. And so, you know, I recognise in a different way this conversation. You could decide, you know, if, when I'm a 14 year old, I could decide to have an identity crisis or I could I could find out that I was only going to be British with Indian and Irish parents who weren't likely to be Belgian or Spanish or or, or something else. But it's, it, the good news is it's easier in the 2020s for yes. Hong Kongers who come in. In the 1950s and the 1960s, if you were Jewish or Irish or Black Caribbean or Asian, you might have felt quite a strong tension. If you want to live in London and Manchester and Birmingham and the towns and the suburbs and decide how British, how, how much from your uh, heritage, what, what the balance you want is, you can, you can do it more easily. What society has to do is equal chances, no unfair barriers wherever your parents came from in the first generation, in the next generation. Britain's got better at that in my lifetime. And the foundations of, you know, we need the commitment to the democratic norms and values. Those are there. And we want to encourage the bridging and the bonding, not to say choose, but, but actually we want people with a strong sense of identity um, showing the collective thing. So I think, I think, I think we're in a good place with this, but, but we fail on the no barriers on issues like the main issue on the table today. If you can't go to university because of you've only been in the country three years and so on. So, you know, I think getting the policy right can help to unleash the opportunity to make that choice. The society has moved towards much more confidence about ethnic diversity over the generations. There's work to do, but we're making progress. Yeah, I think Marcia Sen, you know, puts it especially well, you know, when he makes the argument for multiple identity and he says, look, we've all got multiple identities, you know, we've all, we've got nations, we've got regions, we've got kinship groups, we've got religions, we've got intellectual disciplines, we've got professions and occupations, you know, we've got, there are different markers of our identity that we carry. And, uh, and it just so happens that it's often more than one nation now, you know, as you say, Sandra, you know, that people have commitments, have historic and current relationships with more than one nation state. And that's now becoming increasingly normal, although it's not common and to the whole world, it's becoming more frequent all the time. So, uh, you know, I mean, that is that is that, yeah, and I agree that UK is more able to handle that than at any time in its history, uh, prior, uh, since the Roman Empire anyway, you know, it's, 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 it's never been as cosmopolitan as it is in its values. The problem, of course, is you run up against the logic of the treasury, which says we minimise outlays by government you know whenever possible if anyone suggests a new expenditure line we knock it off if we can um and I, so, so the argument about hong kong and recognition and support for say home country fee status in higher education has to be couched partly in terms of well economically the country will benefit from educating and providing a easier cheaper if you like education for this group of people because of what they will put back in economically through occupations and professions in the long term. And I think you can model that. Um, so and to encourage people to come and to enter the higher education system here makes a lot of sense economically. Paula, um, thanks for being patient. Really good to have you on the show and feel free to ask a couple of questions. Thank you so much, Simon. And uh, nice to see some familiar faces. I, uh, I just sort of had a, a quick factual question, which is just whether anyone has a rough figure on uh, how many BNO holders from Hong Kong pass their A levels this summer, and then you know what that figure looks like next summer potentially. Just in terms of you know how many 
um, students are going to be affected by this in the immediate term? I don't know, maybe maybe Michael's got those figures at hand. Um, not to hand, but I can I can get in touch with you and have a crack at figuring them out with you. <laughs> but um, some Sunder might or or, um, or Tommy. I don't, I don't think we've got those numbers. I think it would be helpful to have an estimate, even if it's a back of the envelope estimate. Say it might be dozens, it might be hundreds. Michael's got a good five-year estimate and we haven't got it. The other really interesting thing is having the numbers good, but actually having three of the voices is good. And the really effective thing would be to have a 17-year, 18-year-old Hong Konger studying in Sutton and Trafford and two of their classmates who think it's the right thing to do. You get a very long way, I think, with the joint advocacy of Hong Kongers and British students who are studying together. Just quickly adding to this, I think the general impression, because we don't have the figures either, um, is that like the family are usually quite young, so their children would be in um, primary school or secondary schools, but like in, in the time period of like five years till they can get settlement status if everyone goes all right, then like it is likely there will be, um, you know, I think like two years or three years that people, like young children, well, young adults might be affected by the set issue, but we don't have the figures either. Sorry about this. Michael, did you want to come in? And um, maybe just if we have time after after Paula's next question, if she if there's another one or, or yeah. Paula, have you got any more for us? I actually don't believe I put another question to the chat, oh. but um, <laughs> if I can pose another one, uh, I am curious to hear um you know whether you, you've from from what the speakers have said you know it seems like there's a clear case to do this and that universities appear to be supportive um but then there is that sort of financial constraint that they're coming up against uh and i'm curious whether there's been any pushback at all from from any corners of the sector um, in terms of, you know, how are we going to do this in, in practice? Have, have universities expressed any doubts? Has, has there been anything negative that you've heard? I'm happy to defer to Sunder, but, but not that I've seen. I think um, I was hoping that this would be a chance for people to come on the front foot to the sector saying, look, fees might be an issue, but there will be a way around it um, if that is something which is posing, but over Sunder, Sunder has a point. Nobody at all has said they would be against it. I didn't ask everybody. I didn't do a grand survey. I got lots of support, lots of people saying they didn't realise it, lots of people saying they would be supportive. And if there was an issue, it might be that people secretly think that and know it's not a legitimate thing they could say out loud. I wouldn't rule that out. But um, also the numbers are not enormous and it could play either way. And certainly beyond the Russell Group, it would play the other way. It would be a gain issue, I think. Um, I think there were 16,650 Hong Kong domicile students in universities and um, 23 had more than 250. There were, there were five at Aberystwyth in 2021. And so I think you'd be excluding a group who would come. Um, and, you know, I, I, so I, I, I'm not even convinced that, you know, the, you know the, it'll be handleable because it's a fairness case and you can market it to other people. If there was a group that was coming, you know, just for to be a student, you know, and whether they'd be using a BNO visa or a student visa, you know, there might be a tiny segment there. But I, I suspect I suspect it is not an enormous factor in finances, but it's not an ethical argument to make if it is. I think the overall impact on the number of places by five years time, if half a million more people have come and 70% of them want to be graduates, is a real planning issue of places, but that isn't the same as the fairness issue of fees. Now we're towards the end, uh, Michael, but I'm, I've promised Khadija Amani um, a, a moment uh, to ask his question. So Khadija, would you like to come in? Um, hi, I think I just repeated Paula's question, to be honest, um, and it's been answered. Um, it sounds like we don't really have uh, estimates as, as such. Um, it's I'm actually from the Greater London Authority and I um, it, this is higher education is definitely outside the scope of my work because I'm the regional ESOL coordinator um, and ESOL stands for English for Speakers of Other Languages. Um, so we're mainly focusing on um, English language provision for uh, people who don't speak it confidently below level two. Um, and eventually many of them will progress into university, but some won't. Their aspirations will be mainly to move into employment. But one of the things we're currently working on 
um, in relation to the three-year residency requirement um, is the adult education budget, which also requires Hong Kongers to have been resident um, in the UK for three years. But the advantage we have over higher education funding is the Mayor of London manages the adult education for London. So there's some scope for us to make an argument but as others have mentioned um, in the group already, this three-year residency requirement doesn't just affect Hong Kongers, it affects British nationals mm. as well, including British nationals who have arrived from Ukraine, Afghanistan, and Hong Kong. So, you know, it's like a, a slightly broader conversation. And if you're gonna try and win the case for Hong Kongers, we're gonna actually have to also win it for British people. Um, so I just uh, I just came along today because a colleague mentioned it's on. And also because at the back of my mind, um, I'd like to add a section to uh, some guidance we have for local authorities about higher education and the entitlements people have. So I came to learn from you and I was just wondering about estimated figures in case we could extrapolate a bit into our argument um, for the adult education budget. But Paula answered, uh, asked and I, I got a sense of where we're at. And if you do find that you have any more information, please do share it. Thank you. Well, thank you, Khadija. And I should have said she, not he. Um, the um that's it's i think that opening up the whole local authority in london aspects really valuable um and uh, and i think gives us all food for thought um i'm afraid we're going to have to call it a day uh it, you could i think we could go on for a little bit longer in terms of the practical issues that are beginning to arise um really important conversation um i do think the youtube video will be a useful resource uh, and um, I think we all need to be more vocal on these issues. I'm certainly a convert, and I thank thank the speakers today for doing that for me and for others. Um, welcome to come back on the program and discuss further. I mean, the other side of the coin for me is always, you know, what happens to these great Hong Kong universities long term, and you know, we can create good exit routes, but you know, what happens in Hong Kong is important too, and will continue to be pivotal to the world in lots of ways. I think. Um, so uh, a really important place um, for, you know, for various historical reasons, colonization, accident, uh, and the tenacity and, and quality of the people, um, you know, this remarkable society has developed and, um, you know, it's, it's an asset to, to Hong Kong and to the world um, and, and should be seen by everyone as such. Uh, I uh, welcome you all to come back on Thursday, there'll be others in that attending as well. We expect a fairly large audience. Um, we're going to talk about geopolitics and online education uh, and higher education and, um, you know, where it's all going. Uh, and one of the things we themes we'll pick up, which Claire Callender will lead, is the relationships between states and higher education institutions and, 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 um, and agents. And, you know, there's a sense we all have that, in the geopolitical environment, the state in lots of places is exerting itself more strongly in a somewhat more clumsy way, cutting across free and open dealings within countries and polities, but also across national borders, um, that all of this is being in the, if you like, in the melting pot now. Old assumptions about the way we can, can work and do work can't be taken for granted. Old freedoms can't be taken for granted. Uh, and we have to, in some senses, remake the case for higher education, um, its importance, but also its modus, mode of operating. The highly cooperative and open character of the sector has been a tremendous asset to itself and to the world. We don't want to lose that. Uh, and so how we sustain relationships in the global environment and, within, and with governments, we've got important and difficult responsibilities within countries, you know, is, 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 is I think, the issue before us. Uh, and, and, you know, and, and as always, the values that we, you know, and the way we relate uh, in, the, in, in, in higher education, uh, where perhaps we do better than most of the society, but we don't always do as well as we should. Uh, and, uh, and we've got a lot to learn always from each other. And we've got to make sure that that's possible, you know, that we can keep learning from each other openly and freely in the way we have been doing. I think we've had a wonderful last 30 years. My career time has coincided with a wonderful flourishing of higher education and knowledge and the sharing of it on a world scale. Um, in between all of the rhetoric about, about the knowledge economy and uh, international competition and so on, there's been this open process of dealing with each other in a constructive and creative and productive way, which has really added a lot to the human story. But um, the challenges coming up 
I think for the sector are immense. Um, I see a lot of difficulties ahead and the way we come through this period will have a, an immense impact on the long-term of future of the world. So, because uh, we are an important sector. Uh, okay, folks, so we'll see you um, next Thursday. We'll hope all of our participants today feel free to bring a, a webinar pr proposal forward again in future for CG. Um, and we'd like to know more about Hong Kong to UK. Um, it's an ongoing issue. Uh, and, and, you know, we, we will provide a platform for that discussion in future as we have today. Thank you, Michael, and thank you presenters for a really excellent conversation. Bye for now. Yeah, thank you, Simon. Thank you all. Bye. Thank you. Thanks, all.